I was the distributor in the U.S. That's how I got involved with cookers in the early 80s. I always wanted to buy cook. I just never had any money. The high bidder at the time, that sale eventually fell through a year later. So they put it up for sale again. This time I was the successful bidder and I still had no money. And, and I'm not quite sure how because... To this day, I shouldn't have been. Everybody told me, you, 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 you've, got no, you've got no assets. You've got, you know, I had a little money, but nowhere near what I needed to buy the company. And somehow, uh, fate intervened, and I found everything we needed. And, you know, as they say, the rest is history. You know? So we took over the company in 98. And ever since then, we've been rebuilding um, well, we've just been building Cook back up. We started with the Cook S4s, which were the modern, the first modern non-Panavision lens. I'll, I'll explain that. Pan, you know, Panavision, for the for your viewers that may or may not may not know this, is a closed system. They make they they buy stuff, they make their own stuff, they relabel it, they redo it to make it into a Panavision brand, and they just rent it. They don't sell it. So if you're a Panavision rental house, you've got access to it, but the rest of the world has no access to it. So Cook was the first modern non-Panavision lens. The first modern lens was actually from uh, Panavision called Pre the Primo series. When the S4s came out, it was a magical time because uh, being the, the last prime lenses for the motion picture industry were actually designed in the 60s. And wow. Have no real competition, so they, the, the company that behind them just figured out oh, we don't have to update these because we have no co The only competition is some stuff nobody can buy, the, the Primos. We redid the S4s and it was just magical. Uh, we, they started, we, we were at one point back ordered for three and four years. Let me ask you, let me ask, I mean, that's, a, that's also an incredible story, but let me ask you, what was the design or set of design objectives in the S4s? What were you going to do different? Good question. And this is this something that is not only in the S4, this is our design philosophy for everything we do. So when we design lenses, there, there are, I guess, four things that are important. One is it must have what we, what we call the cook look. And I started to almost mention that earlier with the speed pancros. When we developed the pancros, we came up with a certain look. It's very warm. It's very flattering to skin tones. There are stars in the in the heyday of Hollywood that it would only be photographed with Cook lenses because it made, makes people look good. I've heard this story. So the Cook look is is basically every Cook lens has the Cook look. So you know, so that's that's one. If I, if I can stop you just for a minute, because I'd really, I'd really like to get into that. Uh, the, again, the stories, for those who do the research, it, uh, are legendary uh, about actors and actresses in their contracts specifying that they'll be shot with cooks. Uh, there's, in, in the, again, in the mass market, whether it's Zeiss or Sony or Canon especially, people talk about color science and how Canon lenses are warmer and Zeiss and Sony lenses are cooler. So I hear that part of your design philosophy is not to go for the most neutral, but maybe the most flattering or the most appropriate to uh, uh, capturing human beings. A lot of our competitors, you mentioned Zeiss, come from the still world. And, and even though they're making motion picture lenses, they're really, they didn't really make specific motion picture lenses until Airy dragged them into that in the 60s. Um, we've been making lenses since the get-go. So I think we have a much different approach to the design. Uh, we're not trying to design still lenses that people use for motion picture. We're trying to design motion picture lenses, period. And that, and you really come at things differently. You know, with a still lens, you can stand there you, with a still picture. You can just stand in front of it like a piece of art, and you can look around and you can study it for hours. With a motion picture lens, with a motion picture, you've got one twenty-fourth of a second to decide on that image, and you know, bang, zoom, you're off to the next one. Um, so the philosophy on on how you balance the lens, how you 
you know, whether you want a lens that's perfectly flat side to corner to corner, do you want it, do you want to have, do you want it to have fall off? These are different. The philosophy you come at the design from is different depending on whether it's still or motion picture. When you talk about fall off, I, I believe you're talking about more than light fall off. Yes. You're talking about resolution fall off. And focus and everything else. Yes. And, and when you talk about edge to edge within a single plane, I think I'm here you talking about curving the plane to give a, a human face more prominence in the center. We keep the center area, which, which we call a picture height. So if you made a frame and you took a line through the axis of center height and you made a circle out of that, now make a circle. Yeah. That area we pay a lot of attention to. That's what we call the picture height area which is just like I, I'm looking at you, you're right in the middle of the picture height area. And that's where usually the cinematographer wants you to look. We let the rest of it, then we outside of that, we do let it fall off a bit. I mean, it's not terrible in the corners, but we intentionally don't try to keep it, the resolution in the corner the same as the resolution in the center, because that's the way people see things. Now, can you refocus? So you put something in the, in the corner, sharp, you can do all that, but 99% of the time, what what you were supposed to look at is in the middle, somewhere in that middle area. This is so interesting because I recently watched for the first time a 1963 black and white film called Seven Days in May. Do you remember oh, that? I remember seeing it in the theater, which is even more embarrassing. <laughs> You were conscious at a critical moment in time. That was Cuban Missile Crisis in 62, yeah. Kennedy assassination in 63. And Kennedy actually wanted this film to uh, come out. But what was interesting to me about that, besides the political context, is the very point that you make. There were a number of shots where the blocking was so interesting to me because I hadn't seen it before. The focus of the scene, the person, would his face would literally take up half the screen, either right or left, and then there'd be two other people in slightly less focus staggered in the back. So I'm fascinated that the philosophy of Cook is let's think about not perfection, but about optimization for what we're actually filming. I got the greatest compliment once from one of my main competitors he came up to me at a trade show and he said, uh, he said, Les, he said, yeah, we, meaning his brand, he said, we make the best lenses in the world. And I'm not going to argue with him because, you know, he's wrong. But, <laughs> but he said, he said, and this is the compliment part. He said, but your lenses, meaning cook lenses, he said, your lenses have personality. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. Because um, we are not, we're, we're storytellers. I mean, our customers are storytellers, and they need a product that's going to help them tell the story. They don't need perfection. They need a product that's going to tell the story. And perfection, frankly, is in the eye of the beholder. It's not, you know, it's, you know, it's not a mathematical formula that says this is the way you do it. It's perfection, and it depends on what you want to do with it. This is such a lovely subject for me in particular. Uh, I shot Canon for decades. I am not a Cook buyer. We, we, we both know that, a Cook user, uh, coming from the still world and switched over to Sony. And uh, there was a lot of, oh, Canon's got superior color science, uh, Sony and Zeiss are cooler. But now I'm looking again at switching a few years later. Back to your point of what's the likelihood that I'm going to be using the same thing 20 years from now, let alone 80 like your lenses are. And what I realized is that I am at the relative beginning of my uh, filmmaking or, or video journey, and I'm at the point where I'm still looking for technical perfection because I know until I get past that, me personally, uh, I don't think I've got the tools to then make considered decisions about veering from it. Right. It really, str and, I, and I used as an example uh, Picasso. Uh, he did a film called the old uh, film, a painting called the Old Fisherman in uh, 1895 when he was less than 20 years old. Clearly talented, artistically trained, but it was Picasso who got to Guernica in 1937, which is a, as bizarre as you can make it. Tremendous personality and profoundly more important uh, and unique. 
And it strikes me that there really is a very, very strong parallel, not only in Cook lenses, but in Cook users, because it's, it's really the best, most sophisticated DPs who seem to be using your stuff. We'd like to think so. Well, I think you've got a track record to indicate that that's the case. No, I mean, I just got an email this, this morning, in fact, from Vittorio Storaro, who uh, was just uh, awarded the George Eastman Award of 2017, which was quite an honor. And I, I don't know how he puts all his trophies on his on the shelf, but he's you know he, he loves our stuff as do as you said a lot of the top guys they use Cook.